All right. Uh, my name is Adolfo Romero, and I'm here with my partner, Sebastiano Coco. And today is June 28, 2022. And we are here on behalf of the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program. And we are here at the UFW 706 post. Um, and I'm here today. I have the pleasure to interview Mr. You, you could say your name, just so people could uh, hear it, sir. All right. So, so sometimes I won't hear what you said. So oh, okay. the interview. Yeah. Uh, can you tell me your name, please? Yeah. It's, it's Leonard Anthony Rizzuto, better known as just plain old Len, L-E-N. Fantastic, Mr. Len. Well, it is a pleasure here being with you today. Thank you for making time for us. Uh, so I would like to discuss a little, bit, a little bit about where were you born, when and where were you born? I was born in Brooklyn, New York in 1944, October 4th, 1944. All right, perfect. And your parents, can you tell me a little bit about your parents' occupations? My uh, parents were, uh, let's say, uh, close to being Italian immigrants. They were young when they were, when they were brought to the country. Uh, my mother uh, was from Northern Italy and my father was from Sicily. Uh, and New York, I mean, that was a good, I mean, that was a place where people would migrate during that time frame. That is correct. That, that is correct. They, they originally were in a, an Italian community. Where I was born was in a multi-ethnic community. Okay. And how is it that you ended up uh, joining the military, and what branch did you join? Well, at that particular time, 1960, 61, 60, the selective service was in effect. And, and a lot of people uh, in my area, you know, thought about the draft coming up. And uh, I went to parochial school, and I was tired of school, let me tell you. And, uh, and I talked to my parents about getting out of school. I didn't want to go to school anymore. I wanted to get my selective service over with and then get on with life, basically. That was my thought process. The problem is, is when I joined the Navy, uh, the first thing you do is you go to school, and it never ends. The school is school, school, school. You name it, the Navy has a school for it. Oh. And um, what did your parents say when you would join? Were they happy? Were they kind of worried? What no, was... my, uh, my father was not too happy about it because he had a brother that was killed at Normandy and during D-Day. And uh, uh, my grandmother, uh, she believed in reincarnation, and she thought that her son, who was killed, was now me. That was her. That was the way she thought of things. Okay. And so she was re very concerned about my well-being. Okay. No. So did you go right after you graduated from high school, or? No, I, I or? got out of got out of school. Okay. I told mom, "That's it. I'm done." And so I finished my uh, high school education in the Navy, and then I went on and did various other things uh, for my own personal reasons, you know, to gain degrees. Okay, can you tell me a little bit about where were you, where were you stationed and uh, what training camp? Well, I went to boot camp in, in uh, Great Lakes, Illinois, January through May 1962. You talk about being cold. Whew, uh -huh. Definitely was cold up there. They used to think New York was cold, but Great Lake, Illinois, Got him beat, let me tell you. Yeah, you, uh, sorry, proceed. <clears throat> um, yeah, no, I just want to mention, uh, I am from Illinois, and I actually, one of my nephews, he just uh, went to Great Lex, over there also joining the Navy, so I'm going through that uh, process of boot camp. Can you tell us a little bit about that, and how was, those, boot how was camp, that experience? Boot camp in, in the Navy, to me, was easy. It, it was about 15 weeks long. Uh, like I said, January to May, middle of May sometime. Um, everything that they put out was, was relatively enjoyable to me. I was a pretty good athlete in school. Uh, and while in boot camp, I never lost a 100-yard or a 220-yard race. Um, you know, obstacle course was no issue to me. Swimming, which was a requirement, uh, again, was no issue. Uh, all the things that they threw out academically were again, was not an issue to me. Uh, so, so boot camp to me was easy. It was not like, you know, going through an army boot camp. Uh, so. Correct. 
Okay, uh, do any of the instructors stand out to you during that Yeah, time? my company commander was Maxwell C. Todd, engineman chief. Uh, a World War II veteran, basically, in, in, in somewhat in Korea, and, and tough as nails kind of uh, instructor. Um, and back in those days, if you did something wrong, you get slapped upside the head. You know, oh, so, uh, he was used to popping you uh, if necessary. Okay, how did you adapt to that lifestyle uh, during the military? Um, how was it difficult for you to adapt? I mean, coming from New York. No, you know? no, it was not. Um, the, the the transition to me was something that um, was was easy. It was a small bridge just to go across from a civilian, being a civilian to you know being in in uniform. And I think part of that is because I always had. Um, a great respect for a lot of the people that were in the military at that time. Um, my uncles, for instance, uh, uh, the, they were uh, in combat and they talked about it, not frequently, but every now and then, uh, they would talk about their experiences and so. And then the old people in the neighborhood. Uh, I, I used to enjoy sitting, listening to the old people talk about their experiences. Okay, so that sort of prepared you a at least uh, psychologically a little bit, like yeah. what to expect. Yeah, uh, uh, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, and um, when you were done, once you were done with boot camp, uh, what would, what happened next? Where did you go? They sent me to the USS Saratoga out of Mayport, Florida, and uh, we did deployments in various places. The Cuban blockade was the first deployment, so we we were down there for the the, the blockade. Uh, and I think we finished that up in mid-December. So we were there from the beginning of the, of the Cuban Missile Crisis to December. Okay. Uh, and then a few months later, we were deployed to the Mediterranean. Okay, uh, can you tell me maybe around what year was this uh, when you went to the Cuban blockade? Around what time was that? It was October of 1962. October 1962. Yeah. And how was your experiences over there during the blockade? Well, uh, uh, being a, an airman, you know, the lowest level basically, and you had jobs to do work to do, and, and I worked on the flight deck of the of the carrier. Uh, so you know, it all blended in. The politics of the day, well, didn't really understand or did I concern myself with it. The idea of working on a flight deck, considering one of the most dangerous jobs. Uh, that the Navy has, or even in the world, they say at times, uh, I was concerned about making it to the next day than worrying about what the, the Cuban and Crystal uh, uh, crisis was all about. Okay, uh, and then you said right afterwards you went to the Mediterranean, is that Mediterranean correct? was like okay. going on a, a uh, <laughs> uh, let's say, a nice cruise. Uh, although during the Mediterranean, we had a few incidents where uh, aircraft uh, crashed on the flight deck on a joint recovery, uh, injuring quite a few people. And, and I think at that, if I remember correctly, uh, three were killed. Uh, but that's part of what an aircraft carrier is. It's a day-to-day -day, uh, in, in horrific environment. Let's okay, can you tell me a little bit about the work that you did during that time? Yeah, I worked on a flight deck, took care of spotting aircraft. Um, I was also involved in crash fire and rescue activity, um, uh, damage control, uh, and, that, and that's about it. Uh, those three things, uh, uh, aircraft handling, fire, fire and damage control were the primaries. Um, and with fire and damage control, that was uh, regarding uh, what would be in fire, like what, what type of things would you see? Um, well, they train, you get trained to rescue pilots uh, okay. and crew members out of aircraft. Uh, you get you're trained in, in uh, fire suppression. You get trained in, in uh, basically preparing or re repairing the ship if it's damaged. Okay, uh, would you witness, some, I'm assuming you would witness some casualties during that time, right? Or yeah, uh, there was a few. Um, the one that I um, uh, most associate my life with was on uh, 29 July 1967 aboard the USS Forrestal when a uh, inadvertent rocket 
uh, hit the aircraft that Senator McCain, at that time Lieutenant Commander McCain, uh, was a pilot. That, uh, that catastrophic event lasts about three and a half days, and 134 uh, sailors, uh, uh, officers, and men uh, were killed. Uh, I happened to be fortunate at that particular time not be work, working on the deck. I was going to chow. Wow. I was off deck walking to chow when that occurred. So that was a significant event in my life um, uh, that I still think about. Every time I go to the Naval Museum, we do tours. Uh, people call us up at the post and we take people to the museum because you have to have an escort. And uh, there is a... Uh, display of the USS Forrestal and the, a plaque of the 134 people that were killed that day, and I always make it a point to give it a salute. Wow, that's an incredible story. Like, how do you move past that? Like, how do you keep moving knowing that you survived? Like, I mean, you know, it, it could have gone the other way, but you were destined to survive, <clears throat> I mean. The... The fact that I survived, and it goes through my mind, why wasn't it not me, constantly? Um, having gone through a variety of <laughs> psychological, let's say, surveys and things of this nature, they told me I have the Superman complex. Uh, and, and part of that is, be, and I'll explain to you that, um, I got into the crash fire and rescue business the rest of my time in the Navy, basically. So being in that environment, basically a fireman, uh, being in an environment, I had to, to learn how to overlook all of those things that occur that what you would see, that you would uh, basically roll in on. Okay. Uh, during that time, uh, did you made a lot of friends in, in that field? Were you, were you close with other folks around there? Or? Mostly, but it's just, again, this is another situation. Most of the people that I know, I keep at arm's length. Okay. I do not de develop real strong relationships outside of my family. I do have people like here. I do have people that I know here, but again, they're at arm's length. Was this before the incident of what happened, or was uh, this probably be since after the, the accident? After. Yeah. Okay. Um, can you tell me a little bit uh, about the time that you were more expand a little bit on the on the time in the Mediterranean? Uh, would you talk to your family? Would they write to you? Um, yeah, of course. That, that was a daily routine. You know, you know, everybody waits for the mail plane to come and, uh, you know, come aboard and everybody waits for mail call. And did I get a letter? And, what, you know, uh, you, and you can see the disappointment in people that don't get a letter. And, of course, the happiness in those who do get a letter. Uh, so, uh, the mail call is a very important part of being in the military. So I, I tell you that it definitely builds up your morale when you get mail wow okay did you do you have a wife kids or family no i was uh, i was single okay <laughs> so, and, uh, yeah i had a lady friend so to speak back home but uh and you know we can uh, communicate it and when i communicated with my family you know uh my periodically even an aunt and an uncle would get a uh, a, a letter or two, you know. No. Okay. Um, okay. So my next question would be, sir, um, so you were telling me uh, you were in the Mediterranean, but then you went to Vietnam, or when did that happen? And, and the, the accident aboard Forrestal, we were off the coast of Vietnam. Okay. It was our first deployment uh, for that carrier. Uh, we were on station for about five or six days when the accident occurred. And uh, we were taken off the station, obviously, uh, because of the severe damage to the ship. We went into the Philippines, um, Longapo, uh, for about a week to 10 days, get the ship prepared to come back home. And, and we did, and uh, came back to Portsmouth, Virginia. At that particular time, I was transferred to the uh, pre-commissioning crew to John F. Kennedy. Okay, and what did you do there uh, once you came Well, the pre-com, we train, you know, we train to get the ship ready to go. Okay. It's, it's being built. It's an honor to be a, a selected for uh, pre-commissioning uh, of a crew at a, at a senior level. At that time, I was a first-class petty officer. Okay. Uh, so 
we trained you know to get the ship prepared get the ship operating um, work with a lot of civilians in the shipyard telling them what they need to do how they need to do it to make our lives better when we when we accepted the ship because right. sometimes they put equipment in backwards oh, wow. and so we knew how the equipment was supposed to go uh, so we worked a lot with the shipyard people okay so how long were you there in virginia doing uh, this work most of my career i spent in virginia from 1965 to 1985 i was in virginia in Norfolk, Virginia, and I went from carrier to carrier to carrier to carrier, shore duty then carrier to carrier. Wow, okay. Did you have a second draft? Were you drafted any time, or did you do a second tour anywhere? I re-enlisted. re-enlisted? I re-enlisted. Um, uh, let's see, my first re-enlistment was for six years. My second and third re-enlistment were two years at a time. They had different programs then. And at, during that particular time, I was advanced to uh, a senior chief petty officer. Okay. Um, you know, after going through a lot that you went through, th through a lot of events, what made you decide to stay in the military? Because you could have, I mean, after the first time, you could have stopped or maybe done something else, but you decided to re-enlist. Yeah, I enjoyed, the, I enjoyed the Navy. I enjoyed the Navy until the day they told me I had to get out. <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoyed what I did. Uh, I enjoyed the, the, um, the, as I say, it's kind of strange to say, but they're part of the camaraderie. I liked the, the fact that I had a strange career and I was transferred frequently to other commands. Uh, I was good at what I was doing. And so I would get selected by a commanding officer to go to his ship. Okay. So. Can you tell me a little bit about the positions uh, that you, uh, medals? Um, I know like well, we talked a little bit ago and you had, uh, uh, you have a whole legacy going on in there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I received a meritorious service medal. Uh, uh, I've received three Navy accommodation medals, uh, three Secretary of Navy achievement medals, which are now changed to just achievement medals. Uh, most of those, two or three of them, were due to, to saving people uh, in certain situations. And uh, I won't go into any great detail in that. But uh, and then there's a lot of other ones that the Vietnam campaign, the Vietnam Cross of Gallantry, um, uh, Navy Unit Accommodation, ex Expert Rifleman, things, those things that you. you what we a lot of time we call I've been there, you know. And what would you do during your time off? Like, what were some of the things that you would do? On my time off, yeah. Uh, well, I still play uh, travel softball. I play on a seventy-five and above team, and I played trap uh, ball locally three times a week. So that's what I did uh, when I was off or went to school. Okay, uh, can you tell me a little bit about where did you go to school? Wherever the Navy uh, had programs that would come on the ship or on the base, okay. and they came from various universities. The only thing we had uh, that I would look forward to is that it was always accepted at one university. Oh, so yeah. if you took a course from the University of Maryland or uh, uh, some other institution, that it would all be under the, what they call, I think, the Dantes program. Okay. So that when you finally got uh, enough credits for a particular, you know, for a particular uh, university, they would award you the uh, the bachelor or or whatever it may be. Okay. Uh, did you go through university through the GI Bill, or how did you go through? University? Most of it was on the uh, the Navy's dime. Navy's the, dime. The, right. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with I'm that. Just as simple as that. Uh, they had a lot of programs available for sailors, and you just took advantage of them. Um, I did use the GI Bill when I got out of the Navy, uh, when, I, when I finally retired. Um, I needed to spruce up a little thing, so I was going to go to work for uh, International Paper as an environmental health and safety person. So there's a few little things I needed to tighten up, and so I went to UWF, done a couple of environmental Courses. I went to Pensacola Junior College and got a, an associate's degree there for um, hazardous material. So. Okay. And uh, did you get other degrees or did you end up uh, with those, the ones that you just mentioned? 
Did you get other degrees or that was it? I have a degree in education. In education? Was, yeah. Okay. Yep. That was from Arizona. Again, like I said, the Navy has a great program about putting pieces together. Uh, and if you don't take advantage of it, well, that's, you know, shame on you. That is correct. That is correct. Uh, so is that? Yeah. Um, if you don't mind, uh, speaking of your career, you said, you know, it's, I don't know, are you the funny said, maybe some people would say that it's strange because you've sort of been through so many different commands yeah I had I, I have a very strange career uh, once I started getting into the um, the pre-commissioning of carriers I went from the John F Kennedy uh, I, I skipped a little bit there. I went to the Nimitz Eisenhower and Vincent back to back to back the three commanding officers because of the work that I did for them uh, as a, when they were executive officers and they were going to the ne their next ship as a commanding officer, pulled me with him. <laughs> so I was fortunate in that arena. Uh, I got selected to be the, uh, uh, let's say, the director of Navy firefighting. Um, so I had all the Navy firefighting schools under my control, uh, which we'd go around visit, ensure things were being done correctly, why not? And then I got selected by the Undersecretary of Navy Safety and Survivability uh, at that time, Joseph P. Tosic, uh, he was a retired Navy captain who had uh, taken the unit USS Nevada out of uh, Pearl Harbor and run her aground so she wouldn't be blocking the harbor. And I, at that time, I think he was awarded the Navy Cross. But he selected me for his, what they call, quote, skunk works. We were doing a lot of things in the firefighting business, uh, in the civilian community, taking it and bring it into the Navy community without going through all the military specification uh, criteria. And if it was good for the civilians, why isn't it good for the Navy? That was his train of thought. And so that's the kind of work I did with him uh, in his private skunk works, which was actually at the fire schools. Oh. And uh, I wonder about, because so you, you enlisted initially, right? So you said yeah, I enlisted. You were you're an E1, you're an airman, right. lowest man, and you're probably one of the most dangerous places in the world during the Cuban Missile Crisis. It's definitely a hotbed of God knows what. And then you go through, um, I guess as you said, the incident in Vietnam. And so uh, did you, you, how did you reach the officer ranks? Uh, you, you reached an officer rank, correct? Yes, I did. In 19... Uh 77, I was selected for uh, uh, commissioning, and I was commissioned as a, a CWO2, Chief Warrant Officer, second grade. A warrant officer in the Navy is, an, is a technical specialist in his particular chosen field. And uh, uh, then I went to CWO3 and CWO4. And, was there a big difference in becoming an officer versus being enlisted in the Navy? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, a warrant officer in the Navy, the captain's king, let's just put it that way. A warrant officer is one of his princes. So, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty different. Uh, plus, you know, when you have a, an enlisted background, uh, there's a lot of respect from the, the former, you know, enlisted people. And... A lot of officers, senior officers, not necessarily the junior officers because they don't know where you fit in yet, but the senior officers know of your background and how it can help them in their, you know, command. Mm -hmm. Was it difficult to build relationships uh, with the uh, chain of command or how was it? Uh, how was your experience? The, 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 well, again, most of the, the, the enlisted have a respect for a warrant officer or, or what we call a limited duty officer. And uh, most of the senior officers have that same kind of respect. Again, they know what you came through, you know, to get to where you are, and you're the technical expert in that particular region or area. Okay. Uh, can you tell me maybe like a experience or that you went through that was like you found it uh, humorous, like a humorous experience, uh, you know, something memorable from 
Yeah, and I was, I was, uh, we were on a combat cruise on the USS America, and I was sent to Uban, Thailand. Uban, Thailand. Uban, Thailand. It's an Air Force base uh, out of nowhere. Uh, I think maybe they, they uh, uh, took a couple of large weapons and they just blew the jungle away and put an Air Force base there. Uh, but it was in nowhere, and uh, they uh, housed the C-130. Uh, uh, what they call the Spectre gunships. Okay. Those are the aircraft that fly very quietly in the air and nobody knows they're around and you've seen them on TV now, you know, frequently with the, uh, uh, what they call, the, the infrared watching people and then all of a sudden they obliviate. They're just gone. Oh, that's what the base was. Uh, I was there for a special assignment. I cannot talk about the assignment, so, uh, but I was there. It was, a, it was, to me, it was a fun tour because uh, there was only a handful of Navy people and everybody else was Air Force. We lived in a tent, they lived in a barracks. No. <laughs> they lived well, we did. No. <laughs> How long did that tour last? Uh, a couple of months. A couple of months? Yep. Okay. Um, so coming back, how, uh, how did that feel, like coming back to the U U.S. and being in Virginia by the time you moved uh, back over here? If, if you're discussing how the civilian population, you know, yeah. I never ran into an issue. No. Uh, and, and even when uh, I would go visit my family back in New York, my dad was a big thing about wear your uniform, wear your uniform, because he, he wanted to show, show me around to all his friends. So I, I wore my uniform. Never had an issue with... Um, the, a civilian um, uh, or a group of civilians. No. So the people that have, uh, well, that was their thing. To me, it was never, it never was a, a problem. Okay, um, how do you think the military changed you, changed you who you are as a person? Uh, I think I tolerate people a lot more. Uh, I think that uh, it taught me how to get along and how to, to remember that there's a compromised position somewhere. You're not going to get everything. You know, you, you can demand what you want, but that doesn't mean you're going to get everything that you want. So you learn how to, to compromise. You learn how to deal with the different groups of people that, uh, that you associate with. Uh, I mean, you, in, in the Navy, it's a, it's a melting pot of different people, different educations, different backgrounds, ethnicities, religions, and so on. So you learn to, to deal with all of that. And, and uh, I found it uh, comforting, comforting, you know, that we can get along and we can uh, complete a task. You know, here's the mission, let's get it done. I don't care what your color is, I don't care what your religion is, I don't care, none of that means anything. We have a job to do, let's get it done. When you went to missions, uh, how many people would be with you? Was there like a two-person team or? Four? No, most most of um, in my group were in, in the thirty number, twenty-five to thirty people all the time. Uh, the the entire division would maybe be up to one hundred and fifty people. When it was broken down into sections, it would be about you know twenty-five or thirty people. Okay. Uh, during your time um, overseas uh, in Thailand, like per se, were you able to like go to the towns, local districts, or were you just in the base? Where the, the, you there was nothing. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> in that particular region, no, there was nothing. Like I said, somebody just, just blew a hole and said, oh, <laughs> we're going to put a base right there. Uh, now in the Mediterranean, you know, we, we visited, you know, multiple ports and uh, of course they, most of it was enjoyable uh, and even when we did what we call a Westpac cruise go to you know uh, Western Pacific you go to Australia you go to uh, Hong Kong you go to uh, the Philippines you go to Guam I mean you, just a, a variety of places that the average American doesn't get the chance to see so I got to be a worldwide traveler uh, I have a curiosity about the military, and so while you were there, the Cold War is on, right? Yes. And so, I mean, I guess there's—I don't know—I don't know where the line in the water would be, but was it like 
how was that experience in terms of knowing like this is our side or something like that? Well, when you're in the Mediterranean, for instance, you're always shattered by a Russian ship, uh, usually a trawler, sometimes a little um, um, one of their missile frigates, whatever, and they're usually right behind you, real close, and you're. And the commanding officer is also, you know, sending a message to that particular ship, you're too close, stand off, and so things of that nature. Um, it didn't bother me uh, because I had a different job to do. Uh, but we'd look at the, the, uh, uh, the Russian ships. They would come alongside and, you know, get in front and cut, cut across your bow, things of that nature. And that was more of uh, the politics than it was the 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 day-to-day -day activity, you know, of the average sailor. The CO had to worry about that, you know, and, he, and of course he would be broadcasting to back to the states to tell the embassy, to tell the, the Russian embassy, to tell the Russian navy, you know. But to me, pff, nah. it was just just one, watch him. Just one more vessel. Yeah, this the... is just another day. And then periodically we get overflown by the Russian bears. The, the bears and badgers, they're bombers, and they would come down real low, and you could you, you could actually see the people in the window uh, of the aircraft that was flying by. It would make two or three passes, sort of like uh, harassment, if you want to put it that way. But to me, on a day basis, just look at them, they go by, you wave, and that's it. Or maybe you give them a finger. You know, you tell them they're number one. <laughs> But uh, um, what about, uh, you say you stopped in seaports in the Mediterranean? Yeah. Where were like some of the... Well, we, you know, in, in, in Naples, Italy, uh, uh, Barcelona, Spain, uh, uh, Athens, Greece, uh, at one time Beirut, uh, before it got to be crazy there, uh, Alexandria, Virginia, uh, not Virginia, <laughs> Alexandria, <laughs> Egypt. <laughs> Uh, so most of these ports we went to were, were somewhat friendly. Um, I don't recall, you know, big demonstrations out there saying sailor go home. Uh, so most of the time when I went ashore, I wanted to see uh, the, the local attractions for one. And then when I wanted to eat, I wanted to know where the locals ate. I didn't go to a tourist place. I found, like normally I would be the shore patrol officer or the beach guard officer. I would ask one of the local policemen, where did they eat? And we'd go there to eat. I found that it was a lot better than the tourist restaurant. So, so you had uh, good, good food experiences in this Oh, process. absolutely. My experiences um, in the Mediterranean uh, uh, were top notch as far as, <laughs> you know, I got to see things that people don't ever see. And I went to the Acropolis, you know, and, uh, and you know, seeing that, of course, various uh, things in, in Spain and in Italy, uh, went to Germany from Italy, you know, got on a train, so, so spent, you know, a week in Germany, mm -hmm. uh, Austria, things that the average American did, didn't get a chance to do. I got a chance to do that and like, wow, this is, this is pretty neat. Would you go by yourself, or would you go with We usually go with a little group of guys, you know, and it, it from, um, and like I said, I keep people at arm's length, but there was always three or four that we, you know, sort of on the same level, and uh, so let's go, let's go do something. And uh, we'd go to, uh, you know, maybe from uh, Naples, we'd go up to Florence, Italy, and uh, take a look around. Wow, oh, this is a pretty neat place, you know. Were you able to ever see some of your descendants, family members that live in Italy? No, but that's a stra strange story. I, I play, when I played softball, they had our names on our shirts. And uh, we were playing softball in, in Sicily. And uh, some Italian, or some Sicilian, uh, he noticed the name. Mm. The next thing we know, they're pulling a tub full of wine. <laughs> and, you know, two, two or three tubs full of wine down there, and he's and we're trying to communicate. I don't know what he's saying, he don't know what I'm saying, because my, my, my parents <laughs> would not teach us uh, uh, their language. They said we were American and that was it. Uh, so we did communicate a little bit to got to the understanding that, yeah, well, I'm a risotto, and thank you for the wine, <laughs> that kind of thing. Of course. <laughs> oh, wow, great story. Thank you for sharing. 
Um, so how do you feel about that? Um, you know, being American, being born here, uh, do you still follow your roots uh, from Italy or? Not, not, not too much. Um, my, uh, my mother, uh, she had felt uh, in her lifetime that uh, Italians in, in, in her lifetime were respected. Okay, I'll just put it that way. A lot of prejudice. And so she didn't want that to be bestowed upon us. So she said, my children are American, period. That's it. And she told that her parents had to, to become citizens. So they became citizens. Uh, and they were, they were very proud of that. And uh, uh, as far as my experience with it all, uh, I know I'm of Italian uh, background. But I also know that I am an American, period. And I just leave it at that. Uh, my children, they all know that, you know, of the background. And again, they're all told that they're American. I got three boys and one girl. Can you tell me, where did you meet your wife? Where did you meet her? Your wife? Uh, which year or where and when? <laughs> my wife passed away two years ago. Okay. Uh, uh, but she was a great influence because um, uh, she was Polish and she experienced the same thing in Cleveland where she came from. And so uh, we sort of like understood each other about where, where our offspring was going to go. Those kids were going to be an American and that was all there's to it. Uh, Okay, so most of your life, uh, how did you end up in Pensacola? Like, what made you come back over here? Uh, I, I went to school in Pensacola a couple of times, and uh, it's a Navy's well-kept secret. Although the other gentleman was talking about Pensacola's backwards a little bit compared to Mobile, and maybe a few, let's keep it that way, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> you know, two light cycles is a traffic jam here. And, uh, <laughs> And I like to keep it that way. So uh, the, the opportunities that are available, uh, my youngest son is a supervisor of, of maintenance over Mobile. Eh, it's in Mobile, yeah. My oldest son is a high school coach over in Daphne, Alabama. My daughter married an Air Force pilot, and she lives up in Kentucky. He's a retired colonel. Uh, my middle son lives in California, and he's a fire jumper, or was a fire jumper. They're all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. good. Well, they choose their own path. So how did you end up finding out about the BFW 706 post? How did... Well, I don't live very far from it, and I've been back and forth, and I was an elk for, for many, 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 many years, and that elk lodge uh, on 72nd Avenue, uh, Basically, its membership went from 2,000 to about 200 wow. uh, in a short period of time. The people are not joiners. And uh, so I joined the Moose for a while and found that their population is going down too. And uh, so I said, you know, one day past this, I said, you know, let me inquire. And they had karaoke going on. And at that time, a, a lady friend of mine uh, was singing karaoke. This is, uh, goes back maybe six, seven months. And uh, so I said, well, all right, we'll step in and see what it's all about. As soon as I stepped in, uh, the post commander came and started asking questions. <laughs> and next thing I know, you know, I'm, yeah, yeah, I'll sign on. And the next thing, oh, yeah, you got, we need an adjunct. Will you be the adjunct? What, what's an adjunct do, you know? So that's how I got uh, involved in the, in the post. Can you tell me a little bit about your position as an adjunct? What is it and what do you do? Secretary. 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 All right. Secretary, whatever the post commander needs, correspondent wise, file and so on and so forth. That's, that's what I do. So for the 706, are, uh, do you see expansion happening, or what are you guys we're, doing? We're hoping. About that? We're hoping the membership. We got a big membership drive. We got 100% uh, this year, and they did, They had a ton. According to the archives, they had 100% last year also. So it, it, it's a battle to get 
the younger people uh, to join. They're not, they're, it's not joiners. And when you go talk to a lot of younger people out there, they, they say, well, you know, VFW, all you guys do is talk about, uh, you know, Vietnam or World War or Korea or something like that, smoke cigarettes and drink beer. No, 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 there's a lot of programs here. I'll give you an example. A veteran came in the other day, um, down on his luck a little bit, water heater b broke. Uh, he was looking for help. We came in, we bought him a water heater. We're installing him for him. So people don't know that the, the VFW has so many outreach programs for veterans. And they will help beyond a veteran, uh, you know, somebody from the community if, if necessary. But it's primarily for veterans. All right, so right now, how many people do you said uh, are members? Well, this, this particular post has uh, Active in this local area, about 300 and some, 360 members. Uh, 900 by the roster throughout the United States are members of this post. In other words, people that lived here transferred someplace else and still kept their membership at this post. Can you tell me a little bit about the history of the 706 post? This, this post was... Um, had a different name at one time, uh, and it was in a different location. That building um, was sold, and they had to look, of course, obviously look for another one. And this is what they come up, come up with. with uh, and they wanted to always be close to the base, and this is relatively close to the base. The, the other name was called uh, uh, Welch, and this one's uh, Marty Lewis post. And they would normally be named for somebody in the military that may or may not be significant. There's some discussion on why uh, these posts aren't named, you know, after Medal of Honor winners. Yeah. For a variety of reasons. Yeah. Uh, one, there's not a whole lot of Medal of Honor winners, for one, and there's a lot of posts to go around. And then there's recognizing somebody who's done a lot for the veterans, and naming a post for that individual is an honor for him, if he's still alive, and his family further on down the line. And that's what basically this, is, this one's about, naming uh, for Captain Marty, who started as an enlisted man, as an airman, worked his way up to a Navy captain and uh, did a lot for, you know, for veterans and, and for the Navy itself. What do you feel this post has done for you? Like, uh, what has it done for you coming here? What does it do to you? Like, how do you feel about coming here? What does it offer? Well, I, I want to, when I go to, when I join it all, whether it be the, the, the Moose, the Elks, I want to give and make it better than when I had, you know, when I leave. Uh, so I'll do what I can. I volunteer for, for a variety of things to help out. For instance, oh, we have uh, these tours that we do for uh, uh, the Naval Museum because tourists cannot get on the base. They need an escort. And the escort has to have a military ID card. So they contact us. We take them you know, two, three, four hours on the base and see the Blue Angels fly and uh, tour the museum. Uh, we do work with the Navy Relief Society, Navy Marine Corps Relief Society. Uh, we provide manpower for whenever they need it. Uh, we pro provide uh, grants, you know, a couple of thousand dollars uh, for their food drive. We have our own food drive a couple of times a year. Uh, we have our own uh, uh, raffles and 50-50 where we, you know, basically generate money to give back into the community. Uh, okay. I have one question uh, going back to the military. Uh, when you ended up coming back uh, over here to the States, uh, did you stay in contact with anyone? For, for a period of time, every command that I had left I would get a Christmas card or things of that nature, but as the years go by, you know, two or three years, then that, that disappears. Uh, right now, there's nobody from any of the commands I've been in with uh, that I really associate with. Or uh, when I say that, if there's going to be a reunion, 
of one of the carriers and it happens to be in Pensacola, uh, they'll get a roster of people and whatnot and more than likely they'll get an email and say, hey, we're going to have a reunion of the USS Nimitz uh, at the base or downtown or whatever. And yeah, and I'll go to one of those reunions and maybe there'll be one or two people there that, that I know. Okay. Apart uh, from this organization, BFW, are you involved with other organizations, veteran organizations? No. No? No. Okay. This, just a VFW at the present time. Okay. That's awesome. Um, well, I guess, um, I mean, it's pretty, you said 31 years. 31 years. In the Navy, right? So it's... And if it wasn't for Clinton, I'd still be in. <laughs> <laughs> President Clinton started a reduction in force, and at 30 years, I had to write a letter to the uh, chief, excuse me, chief of naval personnel requesting to stay on longer, and uh, we agreed to. I wanted more than one, but we agreed to one year, so I got 31 years in. So, but ideally for you, you would have even carried on. I'd, I'd still be there today. <laughs> I think, as I said earlier, I enjoyed my time in the military. Uh, I enjoyed the different jobs that I had. I enjoyed the way my career panned out. Um, a lot of people get stuck in one place for an awful long time doing the same thing they get in that rut. I was very fortunate. I got transferred frequently. Uh, when I say frequently, about every two years, I was going to another command. Um, and again, I base some of that on the fact that um, the, the uh, high-ranking officers knew of my background and said, hey, I can use that particular t expertise in my, my command. So. Mm -hmm. Is there some kind of a uh, common thread that you see like going through all this transition like time after time, you know? Yeah, uh, the ability to run a flight deck to orchestrate everything that you see going on on a flight deck. Uh, my last job was on the USS Lexington uh, as far as seaborne jobs were concerned. My last Navy job, I was the uh, officer in charge of all the flying fields in the area. There's 13 of them in Alabama and, and Florida, training fields. But, uh, but most of the commanding officers, you know, want somebody that can operate the, their flight deck. Oh. Simple enough in words, but huh? <laughs> oh, yeah. I guess you work up to it over time, right? If if you want to do something right, you better have the right people. Amen. Do you miss flying? Uh, no. The nineteen when I left the Navy, that was then, okay. and I and I moved into an, you know the corporate world. Uh, international paper where I found that I could say things that the corporate people would never believe they could say. And they would ask me, you know, how come you get away, you can get away with that? I said, when I go out and talk to the, to the plant, I'm talking to the guys that were like me. All right? So, and you guys came in at the high level management all the time. I never did. I started at the bottom. So I go in a plant and we start shooting the breeze with the guys on the assembly line or uh, in the uh, control rooms and whatnot. And I always bring out that I was a retired uh, Navy and that, oh, that's common ground. A couple of guys here, hey, I was in the Navy. <laughs> so that's how I broke a lot of ice to get through to the things that I needed to do, you know, when we were doing an environmental health or safety inspection. Okay, I, I wanted to ask a little bit more about your retirement. Once you left, like you said, you went to the corporate world, uh, working national paper company. Uh, what was the type of job that you would do there? What type of job would you do? Well, environmental health and safety is, okay. is uh, uh, when I went to a particular uh, plant to do an environmental audit, you had to meet all the government requirements, state and federal government requirements. So we were ensuring that that plant or that facility was was doing the right thing. Uh, if I went there to do a uh, uh, a safety inspection again under OSHA, you know we were ensuring that they were they were complying with all the OSHA and state rules and including their own rules. 
And then when I did health inspections, it was more like we go into the plant and I would do hearing tests, I would do visual acuities, I would do blood pressure, you know, so things of that nature. Low level medical, uh, just to make sure that the, uh, the, the employees and have a, 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 a small list that they could bring to their doctor to get them to do the things that they need to do. Because we had guys drive a forklift to give them a visual, a vis, uh, a visual acuity test and they couldn't see. And, wow. and so we had take them off the forklift, keep them out of that until they got a set of glasses so they could see properly. And that happened, that's an actual fact. I would ask which company, but I'm not sure if you're allowed to talk well, about it's, it. <laughs> it's, it, was, it was one of our satellite companies. Satellite companies. Yeah, we, oh. International Paper owned a lot of companies. Okay. So, and then we'd visit different ones, and they would buy different companies. When we do, when we bought a company, um, you know, we'd go in and do an environmental audit. Uh, you know, we had a responsibility to ensure that they, before we bought it, that they were doing the right things. We didn't want it to inherit a headache. Oh. Not at all. Um, when the companies would actually get bought off, uh, would they? Uh, would you see like a difference? Would they actually follow the standards, follow protocols, or it was just oh, kind of like show? Believe me, believe me. Uh, I was also an OSHA inspector. I worked for OSHA as a special government agent. Wow. That was another part of my my life. Uh, let me tell you, uh, the, the government can become very handed, uh, heavy handed. Uh, you violate a few of their rules consistently, they put you on the blacklist, and then you, you're, not, you're not capable of doing business. So you're out of business. Let's take um, a, a chemical company, for instance, continually violating the rules, violating the rules. Uh, they're going to be fined. They're going to go to court. They're going to have uh, different hearings. Eventually, the ownership is going to be put in jail and that company is going to be forbidden to do any business with the United States. Oh. So yeah, they comply, believe me. <laughs> and uh, how long were you doing this for, uh, the national paper? Um... Uh, I think that, about 16 years, 17 years. That's a long time. That... Then, I did, then I said I'll retire. And then again. you retired. You retired again, yeah. How's retirement? Uh, I got a part-time job. <laughs> I don't retire. I, I work for, right now I work for uh, Scott Miracle Grow Ortho as a representative in the area. Uh, the products that we sell in Home Depot and, and uh, uh, Lowe's and things, and sometimes Walmart. I don't retire. I was going to say, like, what's, uh, what's next on your agenda? I don't know yet. I don't know yet, but, but I don't retire. Uh, I, have a, I have a dream of, of dying at third base, and that's, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> wow. Okay, well, uh, what I want to say, like, once again, thank you for your service. But Appreciate you. Before we conclude our interview, uh, I wanted to see if you had <clears throat> any comments that you would like to offer uh, to the people out there, veterans out there, or uh, incoming um, military personnel, crew members that are in the military. Well, they say that the World War II veterans were the greatest generation. They wrote the book about it, and they talk about it quite a bit. I always hope that the next generation is better than the generation that I'm in, or was in, or will be in. That's what that was. I think I have hope for this country. I think, I think that this country uh, does the right things for the right reasons, but there are times when we have poor leadership, but that's what's good about our voting system. I do believe that it works, although we're having the, com the conflict at the present time about it, but I think it works, it works fairly. I think that the, uh, the volunteerism of our youngsters who voluntarily, they don't have to worry about a draft, who join the military, Knowing that they're going to go into harm's way, harm's excuse me, <clears throat> harm's way, is proof of the kind of people we have, and they are part of the, the greatest generation. 
It may be their generation, but it is a great generation. Okay, uh, one more comment I have. Um, you were talking about sort of like improvements, you know, maybe how can the military improve the Navy, the military itself, or what do you think improvements that they can make on their end? My personal opinion? Yes, sir. Let the people become warriors like they're supposed to be, not social um, change personnel. Uh, Social change will catch up to the warrior, but you need the warrior first. You don't need the individual worrying about uh, the words that he uses to get things done. In my day, I knew every curse word in the book, <laughs> and I used them, and I got things done. If I was to ask some of my subordinates, could you please do this? I don't want to hurt your feelings. It wouldn't get done. Oh. Uh, that we need the warrior out front first, then let the other things catch up. Okay. Um, I guess the w one last question that came to mind is, out of everything that you learned during the years in the Navy, what's something that you think still carries on in life with you, like teach, like things that you've learned, anything, you know? Making my bed every morning. <laughs> You may, sound, you may think that that's funny. There's a speech that I remember. There's an admiral, yeah. and he was chief of uh, the SEALs. He brought that up. But that's something that be way before him, and every, probably every sailor, you make your rack. You, you do that. I enforce that on my children. Uh, we held field day every Friday. In other words, we clean the house, top to bottom. We still do that today. I do it anyway. Uh, my kids will talk about it with their grandkids, and I got great grandkids, field day. These are things that uh, are so ingrained in me that if I don't do them, like, oh, something wrong, and I don't care what time it is, I got to go do it. Uh, that's basically what I learned. <laughs> If you don't do anything, get things accomplished. Right. If you don't do anything, at least you'll have your bed done at the end yes. of the day. Yeah, and the, and the admiral is correct. <laughs> correct. Yep. Great speech. <laughs> All right. Well, with that said, uh, we will conclude the interview. If there's anything else you would like to add, but no, I appreciate what you guys are doing. Uh, I just wish more of the veterans would get in and tell their story one way or the other. It doesn't have to be a combat veteran. No. It, 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 it could be somebody in the rear with the gear. It could be somebody that never left Washington, D.C., or whatever the case may be. They all have a story to tell on uh, their service, um, how it affected them as you asked the questions, you know, how it affected me throughout you know, my life. And, and, and I, uh, I, I talk about it even today, how I hold people at arm's length. I don't allow them into my circle other than my, you know, my own, my own family. Uh, I think part of that is because I lost a lot of friends. And so, mm, didn't want to develop that uh, uh, feeling of losing a friend constantly. So, stay at arm's length, I don't know that much about you. We get the job done, yeah, I have a few beers with you. And you go on to, to Valhalla, the happy hunting ground, or wherever it may be, oh, okay. That was Bill? Oh, sorry about that. Oh. All right. But I appreciate what you guys are doing. Thank you, sir.